is available. I would like to ask you to turn off your camera and mic during the webinar. And if you have any questions during the presentations, uh, please type them into the chat box in your Teams control panel. Uh, I'll bring them up after the presentations are over. Uh, we'll have time for the uh, questions at the end. And here is the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, our Trade and Investment Commissioner at Flanders Investment and Trade, Sara Dekman, will uh, give opening remarks. She is based in Istanbul. Uh, next, Peter Ferplanken, Deputy Director in Work Investment and Aftercare at, again, Flanders Investment and Trade, will give an overview of why Flanders is a, a logistics success story in the heart of Europe. And uh, our second presenter is Mr. Chris Nails. He is a manager in our nationalization at uh, VIL, which is Flanders Innovation Cluster for Logistics. Uh, he will focus on Flanders as a global uh, supply chain powerhouse and, uh, and the ideal uh, European logistics hub. And uh, Mrs. Ingrid, uh, she is a key accounts manager, uh, shippers and forwarders at Port of Antwerp. And she will focus on Port of Antwerp uh, getaway to the European continent and uh, solutions for Turkish industry logistics. And finally, Mr. Sinan Bezut, uh, general manager at Katunazi Turkey. Uh, he will explain their smart logistics and engineering solutions. Now, without uh, further ado, we will turn the time over to Sara. Let's start. Good morning, everyone. And before our experts will start with their presentations, I will give some information about Flanders and Belgium. Belgium is a small country in the middle of Europe, and it's one of the most globalized countries of the world. We only have a population of 11 million, but we are very connected to the world. And how we are connected, that's something we will try to explain to you in more detail today. We have no natural resources apart from our own brains, and we are experts in adding value to goods and services. Basically what we do, we import, we add value and we export again. And that is how we get rich. Belgium is a prime business region and it's strategically located in the center of the most prosperous part of Europe, squeezed between the UK, the Netherlands, Germany and France. That region is home to more than 60% of Europe's purchasing power and has one of the highest concentrations of people, industry and money in the world. Next to its advantageous geographical location, we also have the right smart tax regime, we are very welcoming to research and development. We have created a friendly business environment and we have one of the most productive labor forces in the world. The capital Brussels is the place where decisions are taken. It's home to the EU headquarters and also to NATO headquarters. And with our strong international connections, we see the need for international cooperation. But we also see the need to focus on technological advancements to stand out as a small country. Belgium, we're very proud of that, is the third most innovative country in the world. And we're also the 13th largest exporter in the world. Uh, exports contribute for 80% to our GDP in Belgium. So it's extremely important. In Belgium, we have three regions. We have Flanders region, Wallonia and Brussels capital region. And Flanders region is by far the most important region of Belgium for foreign trade. Flanders region alone is responsible for over 80% of all the Belgian exports worldwide. And if we look at Turkey, the for, at, at, at the foreign trade with Turkey, the numbers are even more impressive. 91% of all Belgian exports to Turkey come from Flanders. And 93% of all imports from Turkey to Belgium go to Flanders. Flanders Investment and Trade, we are a governmental agency with two main responsibilities. We try to attract foreign direct investment to Flanders, and we have been quite successful in that over the past 40, 50 years. We are encouraging also foreign trade by helping Flemish companies with their exports. We have more than 100 offices worldwide and in Turkey we are based in Istanbul inside the Consulate General of Belgium. Normally we're uh, always present at uh, not necessarily the capital but definitely economically the most important city. Um, and one of the reasons 
that Flanders is so successful in the international trade, it's the strength of its logistic sectors. And in the following presentations, we will try to give you a better insight in Flanders as a logistic hub in Europe. Back to Eski. OK, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, now uh, let's continue with our first presenter, Peter Verplanken. Uh, he has spent more than 20 years working in China, India, Canada, France, and also Turkey, representing the Flemish government for economic and trade matters. OK, Peter, the floor is yours. You are muted, I think, Peter. All right, this should be better, I think, huh? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, but yes. All right. All right, so uh, good morning from Belgium. Good night, uh, everyone. Very happy to be here uh, this morning for this uh, seminar. Um, maybe just a few key takeaways before uh, I start giving the actual uh, presentation. Some things that I think um, should stay in your mind when you think of Belgium and when you think of Flanders. First of all, it's uh, it's quite industrial. Uh, if you think of Western Europe, a lot of people think of service economy. <clears throat> when you look at Belgium and Flanders, uh, what, what, one of the things that is remarkable is that there's quite a bit of industrial uh, activity uh, there. A little bit like Turkey, where uh, I think production and exports are a stronghold. Uh, it is the same in, in Belgium and in Flanders. An open economy, uh, I think that's important. Uh, small surface area, it's not very big. Centrally located, um, large markets around us. A very competitive environment indeed. Um, so a lot of uh, companies, because of the open economy and countries around us are competing for business. It's a knowledge center and um, a, a lot of critical uh, mass for, for talent. Opportunities for you as a company, and I'm thinking about both you as a company in the logistics sector, but maybe also industrial companies that might be joining the session. The opportunity is basically to use uh, Flanders as a platform for the European Union market. Uh, it's about getting your stocks close to your customer. Uh, it's about uh, being perceived as a reliable in-market par partner for your customers. So somebody who not just exports from Turkey, but actually has a, a physical presence, let's say, in the, in the market in the European Union. Business, I think, um, can be a big asset for you. The fact that we have bonded warehousing system, which is quite uh, elaborate, and I will talk about it a little bit later also. It's easy to set up a business and real estate is um, affordable. So those are the main the main points. When you look at uh, Belgium and Flanders in the yellow that you see here on the slide, um, one of the things you notice is it's quite small actually. It's a small country, Sarah mentioned it, wedged between four uh, big markets, France to the south, to the east, to Germany, to the west, to UK, and then uh, the Netherlands to our north. And basically, uh, our economy is geared into those markets. You are integrated with the big markets around us. And that is what business does in, in Flanders, uh, is um, export, import, and work on the bigger, bigger, bigger markets that, that surround us. Um, how do we do this? Um, well, basically, um, when you look at, at Belgium and Flanders, and I'll return to the previous slide, you will see we are also located uh, on the coast. We have a very small uh, coastline, only 67 kilometers, but we have made optimal use of that coastline in that we have four uh, seaports that are located there. The biggest by far is the, is the port of Antwerp, over 200 million uh, tons. And then we have three other ports, Seabrug, Ghent and Ostend. And together they form a cluster, I would say, of uh, logistical activity, which is uh, truly impressive. And you can see that when you, when you look at the figures. Uh, and this is um, a ranking um, of, of uh, 2018 of the world's largest um, exporters. Uh, and this is a ranking not on a per capita basis, but it's a ranking um, on, a, on a total basis. And what you see and what is surprising for such a small uh, country and for such a small region is that Flanders in, in total um, volumes ranks the number 15 in the world, just behind Singapore. And the comparison is good with Singapore because it's a little bit similar. 
uh, we import, we add value, we export. So a lot of trade flows going in and out of the region that we are talking about today. Uh, the number um, for uh, 2018 is over 300 billion. It's 300 billion uh, going out, but also three, more than 300 billion uh, euros worth of, of goods coming back in. So there's a flow of over 600 billion on a yearly basis of goods going in and out. And as a logistics provider or as a manufacturing company, this is a good place uh, to be in. It's an economy, it's a region that really understands and is geared into the flow of goods in and out. If you look at where our exports are, are going to, um, you will see that the number one uh, market for um, you know, products coming from Flanders and Belgium is Germany, which is natural, 60 billion, and the Netherlands and France on a par, and they change places uh, year, year by year. Sometimes Netherlands is second, sometimes France is second, but basically they're in the top three and the UK and then Italy. So basically it's the markets around us. You can see it reflected in the figure and figures and that's what companies um, use Flanders for, is to put a stronghold in the European Union to be able to access these markets. What types of, types of products are um, exported? And I, I put a pie chart here just to give you an idea because some of you might be specialized more in this or that product. Um, so the bulk of it is chemicals and pharmaceuticals, and we will talk about it later when we talk about the, the port of Antwerp. It's, a, it's the ma a main part of what they are doing. Transport equipment, so automotive, both trucks, special vehicles, but cars. Uh, cars, uh, there's a huge flow of cars in and out of uh, Flanders, in and out of the European uh, Union market. Machinery and equipment, mineral commodities, um, mostly for, I would say, the, the heavy industry that we also have, big steel producer uh, also located in Flanders. Plastics is big, base metals, food and drink, uh, something that we are proud of, uh, but uh, relatively small if you look at the total mix of products uh, that we are trading. And then a bunch of other commodities, textiles, precious stones, diamonds, and a bunch of other, other products. So that gives you an idea. Uh, just to mention that also from a talent point of view, when you go to Flanders, a lot of people uh, directly work uh, in a business that is related to exports. One in three jobs, which means that uh, close to a million people are actually uh, trained to um, perform in such, a, such an environment. So a lot of talent available. Then looking at uh, inward investment flows, uh, a lot of companies come to Flanders set up here because it's an open economy and its location, of course. And what you see today is that of all the added value in, uh, in industrial um, uh, activities, uh, almost 50% of that uh, added value is, is created by foreign companies. So international companies that have set up a, a venture uh, in Belgium, in Flanders, and from there are producing, doing R&D, doing sales and marketing, but also uh, exporting. And what you see, this is just an example of 2019. In 2019, uh, there, were, uh, there were investments into Belgium and Flanders for over 5 billion uh, euros. So that's quite impressive. impressive. More than 250 uh, new projects came in, good for more than 5,000 jobs. And this is an ongoing flow, I would say, of companies that come and set up. Where are they coming from? Uh, a lot of US companies uh, come uh, and set up with us. Companies from the Netherlands uh, set up uh, also making use of the excellent infrastructure in, in Flanders. Uh, UK companies, French companies, German, German companies, and so on. China also present, Japan, Israel, and Denmark. So these are the, if I would say, the main investors uh, that are coming in, in the year 2019. Uh, it can fluctuate a little bit, but I would say the top five is quite, uh, quite stiff. What do they do when they set up a company um, with us? Well, of course, you can do different things. Huh? Uh, if you are looking for customers, uh, you know, you're not yet sure of the market. Uh, typically, you would set up a sales and marketing office. A smaller unit, uh, maybe five people, uh, 10 people uh, working the market, getting the market ready for your product. So a lot of sales and marketing offices are setting up. We're quite strong in research and development. Um, it's a science. It's science-based economy. 
a lot of talent, universities and so on. So a lot of research is happening and we have one of the speakers will talk a little bit about uh, the research uh, that we are doing in the, in the field of uh, logistics as well. Uh, manufacturing is a big part of it, so 20%. So companies coming in to produce things in what is perceived as, as uh, I would say, an expensive environment. Huh? Belgium is, is part of uh, Western Europe where, where labor cost is high. But still, we attract quite a bit of uh, manufacturing. And then last but not least, also 20% logistics. So a lot of logistics companies, even if we have such a, a strong cluster already, which dates back over centuries, uh, still a lot of new players come in and they are quite successful as well. So there's room for, I would say, new players as well. A couple of the companies that have already set up uh, in the logistics field from Turkey. I think there are a few logos that you might recognize. Uh, these companies are up and running uh, in Flanders and, and they're doing quite well. <clears throat> Why do they come? I think a lot of has been said already. So distance to market, both consumer. Huh? So if you, your, your flow is towards the consumer directly, but also towards a business. So business to business um, logistics flows. It's a very good location if that is your target market. Um, it's multimodal. Uh, I won't talk a little, uh, I think the Port of Antwerp will talk more about that, but uh, a lot of uh, options I would say in terms of connectivity. Very open economy again, uh, affordable and plenty of space. Uh, it's quite surprising looking at the location and, and where we are um, in between uh, other ports and, and big capital cities that um, the cost of, of real estate is really still quite affordable. Productive human capital, we talked about it, and smart taxation. And I'll talk a little bit about that more now. Not too much because it's Monday morning and uh, we still have to wake up a little bit, I think. But maybe some basic um, information for those of you that are considering setting something up. Uh, the tax rates, corporate income tax uh, in Belgium has been ref reformed recently. Where the tax rate used to be uh, close to 34%. Uh, today it is 25%. So 25% for large companies. Um, for smaller companies, it is uh, lower, it's 20%. So that's the, the corporate income tax rate. Also, when you look at labor costs, uh, we know it is an issue for a lot of companies. Uh, what we see is a lot of companies um, yeah, in, invest in technologies that reduce uh, the number of labor that they need. In logistics, this is not always easy, but it, it can be done. There are systems for that. But still, labor cost is a, is a factor. And um, so we reduce or we can reduce um, the labor cost also by some reforms we have and some incentives. So the reform is that for social contributions, there has been a, a decrease indeed um, that you have to pay for your um, employees, let's say, and you can see it here from 33 to 25. And this is a typical incentive also, uh, is that when you set up a company the, um, in terms of social contributions, the first um, employee that you hire uh, will be exempt from social contributions for life. Yeah? And this is a measure that has been extended by the new government so this is a measure that, that is quite successful, is used a lot and has been extended. And also for the next five um, employees, there are um, interesting reductions, I would say, and, and it really brings the cost of labor uh, down for companies that are setting up and, and starting. And the idea is to lower the threshold, to allow you to set up a company, to, to, to test the market, let's say, and if you're confident and, and if uh, indeed uh, everything goes as, as you want it to go, then you can ramp up, uh, let's say, employment. But the first six uh, employees um, are, are at a lower cost. Another, I think, interesting factor is um, bonded the warehousing system that we have, which is really performing. Um, it's about postponing uh, customs duties and import VAT. A lot of countries have this. The, the interesting thing about uh, Flanders and, and Belgium is that, um, in fact, it's not limited to certain bonded zones uh, somewhere in the, in the port or close to the port. So it's the whole territory of Flanders can be declared bonded. So wherever you find uh, a good logistics location, a good warehouse, um, you can have it declared uh, a bonded zone, um, even if it's on, on different or multiple sites. Something that is quite interesting for, from a logistics point of view. Um, also this slide, I like uh, including it. Um, because we have, uh, in fact, we have, um, uh, I would say, customs authorities in, in, in Flanders that are really responsive. They're really business-minded. 
uh, and they go into dialogue with business, yeah, and they look at what works, what doesn't work, and they try to make the flow as as um, optimal and as seamless as possible. I won't go into the details of all of this slide, but uh, I just wanted to include it to, to let you know that from a customs uh, administration, I would say we have one of the most performing uh, customs uh, people in, in, in the whole of Europe. Um, as a government, we, we have certain focus, uh, and one of the focuses that we have is um, indeed also logistics, but also um, we focus on food, food industry, uh, life science and health, uh, engineering technology driven uh, solutions, and also looking at sustainability and materials and chemistry. And I have included uh, in this presentation to make it a little bit more fun, uh, a small video uh, that will give you a, a little overview of the areas that we focus on. So as I mentioned, including uh, logistics. So here we go, let's hope it works. All right, so that was the video. There were a few visual jokes in there. I, I, I hope you, you noticed. We don't uh, have a floating around containers with drones, but maybe that is to come. And, and uh, maybe the, the next speaker will talk about it, but I don't know. I think it's a little bit of uh, science fiction still. But um, anyway, quite, quite an interesting visual there. Um, so to wrap it up, uh, I will focus on the opportunities. It's a platform for the European Union. Please use it. You are welcome. Uh, to use it. Uh, we're quite happy to see you and talk to you when, when you have a project. Get your stock closer to your customer. Um, become a reliable in-market partner. Uh, it's an easy place to do business in. Setting up is quite uh, straightforward. Shutting down as well. If, if you feel you're not ready or you feel the business is not there, it's easy to close shop as well. And real estate is quite affordable. So I think it could be quite an interesting uh, area to look at for you. This is where I end. Um, so very happy to, to interact with you uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It was full of information in it. Uh, now we will continue with Chris. Uh, he's a supply chain expert with a long track record in change and innovation projects, both in uh, private and public private collaboration projects. He has more than 25 years of experience in the logistics industry. We look forward to listening to you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. And I was warned for this that I should not have too many presentations open. So there you go. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so Vil is, uh, my name is Chris Nayens. I represent Vil. Uh, Vil is uh, Flanders, uh, I hope. This is better. So Villas Flanders Spearhead Logistics Cluster. We are a membership organization with about 600 members representing the logistics and supply chain industry. And the cluster is uh, funded by the Flanders government, uh, by its members and by various activities we deploy. Uh, we focus on collaborative innovation in the field of logistics and supply chain. So our core business effectively is innovation supporting the logistics and supply chain industry. So that's at the core of everything we do. 
And um, at the core of everything we do are the members. So primarily those are the logistics service providers in the industry. We also have uh, other members more from, I would say, technology providers, etc. but they are servicing basically the purposes of uh, these members. And um, when we say they are at the core of everything we do, we mean really they are making the decisions at the board level, but also uh, where it concerns the innovation agenda. So it's really important to understand that whatever we do as Spearhead Cluster is driven by the logistics service providers in the industry. It is not a top-down approach from, I would say, uh, the academic field, uh, and also the people that work at VIL um, are not uh, academics. We have a background in business, so that I think is important to know. Um, and so together uh, with the logistics service providers in the industry, we have uh, determined what the main focus domains are um, at the heart of our activities. And the four main domains are digital transformation, Digital transformation as in automation, robotization, autonomous vehicles, uh, drones, not to the extent that we have containers flying around uh, at the moment, but you understand the gist of the story. Uh, another really important one is the green supply chains, not just where it concerns emissions, but also, I would say, circular economy and what it means for the supply chain. Hinterland was mentioned already also in, in the talk of Peter. Um, the hinterland connectivity projects we are deploying are also really important for the concerns. The connection between hubs, the corridors, the synchromodal concepts, uh, getting the goods into the hinterland in the most efficient way. And a domain that has been increasing in importance, I would say, together with um, more and more people living in cities is last mile logistics, so city logistics, but also I would say effectively the last mile where it concerns, for example, deliveries uh, of parcels in rural areas. And so it's not city logistics in that uh, respect, but also that brings a lot of challenges. Around these uh, four domains, we deploy uh, five activities of which the main activity is uh, projects and valorization of projects. Um, I will go into that in a second. Of course, when you have more than 600 members, we also use this uh, as a networking opportunity through various activities we organize, uh, such as the VIL Summit, which is focused on content, but we also have uh, events that focus on really networking activities. Of course, 2020 is a special year in that respect, but still we have found new ways of dealing with that. Um, of course, when you talk uh, supply chain, uh, logistics, that very much has an international focus. So whatever we do also has an international um, aspect, I would say. And there is a strong link between the projects and valorization, networking, and the international activities. We have two more additional activities. One is policy advice, but very focused on, I would say, um, very specific domains uh, of logistics. Uh, there's other, act uh, other actors that are more experienced in this, also have a, a small role in training and education. Um, of course, Vil, uh, wants to maximize the existing knowledge in, in the ecosystem in Flanders. Uh, and we do this through multidisciplinary collaboration between many organizations. So you see a number of names, some of them will be known to you. Uh, and as you will also appreciate, they're not only uh, regional um, uh, centers or uh, hubs, but also international. So, um, we, de we develop regular partnerships, but also strategic partnerships with uh, some of the names you see here, iMac focusing on, on uh, I would say, software, hardware, uh, servicing logistics, 
Vito more technological, and Vlir is the, the university's uh, council of. Um, so together, this forms, uh, I would say, the logistics clusters. All these activities combined, they serve the Flanders logistics cluster, um, and of which, um, of course, 622 members, 70% of them are uh, small or medium-sized companies, uh, are represented in VIL. And those 622 members represent almost 135,000 uh, full-time equivalents and almost 14 billion in added values. So I would say the uh, Spearhead cluster does represent uh, the majority of, of those uh, players. So, as mentioned, Flanders is well known for its logistics expertise, as uh, amongst others expressed in the results of the Logistics Performance Index. And um, of these, uh, this expertise will, will for sure be uh, elaborated upon by, by the two uh, excellent cases that will be presented by the next speakers, such as the Port of Antwerp and Katu Nasi. Um, but as you will see here, we are very strong in, in uh, logistics competence, in international shipments, and thus also in timeliness. So that's basically what it is about. But of course, um, the world is rapidly changing and, and thus also uh, the world of logistics and supply chains is rapidly changing. So in this fast changing world, the goal of VIL is to increase the competitiveness of the logistics sector by innovating through collaboration. So our core business, uh, innovative uh, or collaborative innovation. We do that uh, through regional projects uh, where we maximize the regional networks, but we also do it in international projects where we maximize the international networks. So we spend on a regional level, we spend roughly 8 million euros in innovation projects yearly. And you will see uh, in this uh, innovation funnel that uh, you see the types of projects. Um, you don't have to focus too much on the, on the abbreviations, but you will see that it ranges from applied research uh, all the way to the production level. So basically the whole range of technology readiness levels is covered in the type of projects we, we deploy and start every year. So on an internationalization level, we have a strategy that focuses on four uh, pillars, I would say. One of them is really important, is our structural partnership with Flanders Investment and Trade, in which we support the main activities of Flanders Investment and Trade whenever it concerns uh, logistics or whenever it has a logistics um, um, angle, I would say. So, of course, the rest, uh, we, we focus very much on international networks because that's where it happens. That's also where we gain access to, uh, I would say, knowledge that is being developed across Europe and globally, but also that is where we showcase, um, the, I would say, the assets we are developing in, in the region. And then we are also uh, really active in international projects, in European programs, basically in the same, I would say, the same uh, range as on the regional level, um, ranging from uh, coordinating and support activities towards the Commission, all the way to research and innovation actions in that respect. Uh, what is really important uh, for us is the valorization um, pillar in which we try to cross-pollinate cross as much as possible between all these levels and uh, to bring that to our members. So um, I would say, of course, we, for instance, companies on our board are really strong, uh, strong logistics service providers. One of them is speaking, by the way, in a minute, but of course, uh, we want to bring that innovation also to our small and medium-sized companies. So that is really um, the, the function uh, partly of VIL. Then the projects we do, just to give you a taste of it, uh, in those uh, four domains, if we look at the last two years alone, uh, you will see uh, below you have the types of projects, the CSBO more focusing on applied research, 
big, uh, so that is, I would say, a collaboration between universities and companies are on the advisory board. In ECONS, we have more development projects that focus on a collaboration between universities and companies. In the demonstration projects, uh, it is the cluster that runs the project together with companies focusing on research and development. And then uh, the research and develop pure research and development projects, ONOs, is a collaboration between companies themselves. So if you look at these, just over the last two years, you see that uh, there are many, um, I would say, CSBOs, ICONs, uh, and also Cooks. The research and development companies, uh, research and development projects of companies are not mentioned here because there's also, of course, um, um, a non-disclosure in that respect. And the uh, wide topics are uh, projects on a European level. So what you see represented here is that uh, I can go into all of them, but unfortunately there's just a limited uh, amount of time. But what you see is that uh, the projects are all over the domains, I would say. And in many cases, uh, projects cover multiple domains. So it's really rare to see that you have a project that only focuses on, I would say, only digital transformation. Uh, often we see digital transformation projects uh, very relevant for hinterland uh, connectivity or the use cases are focusing on hinterland connectivity or on green supply chain or on last mile or vice versa. When we develop last mile solutions, we need uh, automation or digital platforms to make it happen. So I hope this gives you a taste and, and um, all this basically to make Flanders, the European powerhouse in global supply chain. So uh, for any questions that come after, uh, I will be looking forward. And of course, this is all in collaboration with Flanders Investment and Trade, but also not to forget Vlajo, which is basically the funding agency for innovation and entrepreneurship. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, just a small reminder, if you have any question during the presentations, please uh, type them into the chat box. So we will have limited time for questions at the end. Um, now we will, uh, we all know that the port of Antwerp is the primary getaway to Europe uh, with 80 kilometers southeast of the North Sea located in Belgium. And uh, Antwerp is the second biggest port in Europe. Uh, our next Guest speaker is Ingrid. With her operational and com commercial background, she has a good understanding of the complex supply chain. And uh, now let's listen to her. Floor is yours, Ingrid. Thank you, Esgi. Um, can you all see the presentation? I think so. Uh, let me know if you can't. Um, so we've got now uh, the previous uh, speakers some insights on uh, on high level uh, with Flanders. Um, let me now explain to you how we bring those two countries together. So uh, reaching Europe from Turkey uh, using a port, Port of Antwerp, or otherwise if you are importing from Europe and how it could work. So firstly, I'm going to explain you what is Antwerp exactly, what does it mean for us, how is it placed on the world map. Uh, secondly, I would like you to, uh, I'm going to highlight some, some uh, future plans of the port um, and how we are connected to the world and with Turkey uh, specifically and how your cargo could be in good hands with us. So as we already mentioned it, Port of Antwerp is the second European port. Uh, we don't like to say it, but Rotterdam is number one. Uh, it's Nice to be competing with each other. I think it's, it brings a healthy uh, environment. And on worldwide scale, we are the 14th uh, port ranked. A lot of ports uh, are new. Certainly the Chinese ports are ranked number 10. A lot of, uh, in, in the top 10, a lot of Chinese ports. But those ports are, are quite new. The last 20 years, a lot of new ports have been built. Uh, our port in Antwerp, it's very old. Uh, already the first port activity started in the 12th century. Uh, we reached our golden 16th century. Um, and this is actually how the port looked like. 
and how the first activity really started because it was a booming activity, a lot of trading in Antwerp. So it really helped uh, the city to grow and to make it a world city how it is today. So how did that work? So in the first, in the 18th century, we had the first industrial activity. You can see a glimpse on the left side. This is now uh, a place in the heart of the city, a very modern place uh, with a lot of expensive apartments, restaurants, etc. But on the right side, you can see how the port evolved today to a world-class port in the 21st century. So during time and centuries, we always have been adapting uh, to the needs and growing with the growing volumes and the, of course the containerization. What is it today? Uh, some numbers, not too many, but, but uh, we, we can't go around this. Uh, in 2020, no, 2019, we reached 11 million TU per year. Year by year, we have been growing in volumes. We have around 1,000 companies in our port, directly and indirectly linked. We create daily. Uh, 145,000 jobs in around the port. So you can clearly see that the port is very important for us uh, in Europe, but also in our city and the province of Flanders because it's giving a lot of work to our people. Something interesting for you to explain, what is our role as Port of Antwerp? Because I'm working for the Port Authority. And what are we exactly doing is the fact that we are an autonomous body and we are managing the infrastructure in the port. So we managed maintenance of the docks, the bridges, the locks, the keys, the land. Uh, we regulate the vessel traffic in the port and we do marketing, branding, and promotional activities. What are we not doing in the port is that private companies manage the superstructure and operate the terminals. So we have uh, companies um, owning the terminals, managing the cranes, the equipment and warehouses. So very simple, simple said is everything which is moving in the port, loading, discharging, logistic activities are private companies. We are uh, Owning, we are the landlord, we are maintaining, uh, maintaining the infrastructure and keeping the vessel traffic uh, regulated in the port. That's a difference because in many ports it's also, also different. Some port authorities are responsible for the loading and the unloading of the vessels, not at the port of Antwerp. This is operated by priv private companies. So this brings us to the active key role which we want to affect today we want to be a community builder so firstly we have been a landlord for many times it continues we are a regulator and an operator but what we want to be is being the community builder and that brings us to explain what is my job actually i'm the key account manager for shippers and forwarders we have also other teams uh, focused on the shipping lines. We have product development teams. Uh, our job is to bring the community together, to listen to their needs, uh, to remove obstacles if there are any uh, on, on process sites or on commercial activities. We also promote the port. We want to bring more cargo to the port. I think that's logic. Uh, we also set a project if some companies in the port or shippers and forwarders have, have certain ideas for development and, and, and for the future of the port. We also set up projects, etc. So we have many things to do as long as we bring the community together. Not only the local community, but also we like to be in contact with people like you in Turkey. If you are interested to do business using the port or setting up a company, etc. We are also interested in having a relationship with you. What are we doing in the port? Cargo handling, of course, loading and unloading vessels, but also logistics. We have a lot of value added logistic companies in the port and Mr. Sinan from Katuna, he will certainly explain everything about it. And we also have industry in our port. That makes our port um, kind of a, a top position 
Why? Because it's not only a port focused on cargo handling, but it's a mix with industry and logistics. And that makes our world a top class port because we have a lot of expertise on a very uh, small surface, um, a lot of different activities we can offer. So, Some visibility on the future. This is uh, a quick uh, statistic I want to show you. Just showing that year by year, uh, the last 10 years, we have been growing in volume. The red uh, colors are showing the container volumes, which you can see are steadily growing. But together with, uh, we are also dealing with break bulk, dry bulk and liquid bulk are four of our main cargo categories we are handling in the port. For 2020, we will also have uh, growth showing for next year if we make this graphic, even with uh, coronavirus having stopped all the world trades, we will show some um, volume, uh, some growth on volume. So we're kind of proud of it. What is our DNA? We have five strategic priorities. Uh, for 2020, which will continue for 21, is a focus on mobility. We focus more and more on sustainable mobility, uh, making the model shift to rail and barge. I'll show you a slide later on. Sustainable growth, safety and security, very important for us. We continue to optimize, us, to optimize our process in the port, like uh, remember the vessel traffic control, uh, processes on terminal, uh, increasing uh, safety and security for people, so inventing new tools, etc., together with terminals and other companies. Uh, hand in hand with operational excellence and transition to more sustainable energy. Those are our five strategic priorities as a port for us. If you see the growth figures of the volumes, it means that today we are on 85% of our terminal capacity. We have a capacity in our port of 12 million TEU to handle, um, and we are developing and investing a new terminal capacity for the next coming 10 years. This map is showing the surface of the port and you can see uh, the blue color on it, the light blue color, is a new terminal that we will build. It's a dock, it's a, it's a maritime terminal uh, surrounded by logistics activities. It should increase the capacity with another 6 million TEU and we hope to be finished we are uh, looking on the bright side. We hope to be finished around 2030. So uh, we have to take our um, shovels and dig the terminal, but uh, we hope to finish 2030. I mentioned sustainable energy. Uh, if you are working in logistics, it might not be um, your, your biggest interest, but be aware that as Port of Antwerp, we are a lot of uh, we are investing a lot in different energy sources because we also want to be the port of the future and um, we, we are pre preparing ourselves to be energy neutral let's say perhaps 2040 2050 but something as a port authority we, we already have to work on today so this slide is just highlighting some projects like we have the hydrogen coalition more um, working on energy with hydrogen. Uh, we have steam and waste heat projects. We have uh, onshore power, etc. cetera. Um, not going to explain too much of it, but, but if you are interested in these projects, we can explain more about this in a later moment. So how are we connected? We have daily, uh, we, are, we are daily connected with thousand ports worldwide um, from all the regions, all you can reach from Antwerp, uh, all, all the different regions in the world with weekly shadows, weekly fixed shadows. Um, I mentioned this, this slide short sea because for us, Turkey is a short sea destination. It's not a long distance. We are very well connected and we are as a port increasing our short sea offer because we want to have less trucks on the roads. So we make the conclusion to increase the short sea uh, offer. Certainly uh, with the Mediterranean region, uh, where for us Turkey is included, we need to offer fast transit times, reliable, it's a sustainable solution, because one of the important things to keep in mind is that there's a big lack of truck drivers in Europe. 
Uh, and the short C is, is a nice replacer of this long distance tracking. These are uh, the weekly short C loops which are connecting uh, Turkey with Europe. You can see uh, that many maritime uh, shipping lines are operating these sailing um, loops. It's like MSC is offering the quickest uh, connection with Turkey and Europe. You can reach from Istanbul, you can reach Antwerp in 10 days, uh, from Gemlik it's 9 days and from Gebze it's 12 days. Just to give you an idea, um, like Costco and Hapagloid is operating 14 days from Istanbul, etc. We can give you more information on these this, uh, maritime loops, but just for you to have an idea on how you can reach uh, Europe and, and, and connecting uh, each other. This is um, just a slide on a comparison study which was made a few years ago. Uh, so you can, you have a good connection from Turkey via truck. A lot of cargo is, is, is um, handled by, via truck. And the blue uh, line is the maritime connection. You can clearly see it's longer. Eh? I'm not going to claim that it would be shorter. It's longer, but it's 50% less expensive perhaps some food for thought for you. It gives less risk for your cargo if you are handling high value cargo. It's a lot, it's, it's less risk to, to have this maritime connection and, and to work with containerized cargo. And um, some very big advantage which has been proved these last months is that there's no border delays and congestion. We saw that during the pandemic and, and the lockdowns in different countries, and, and we are still in, in uh, phase of lockdown, in many countries is that a lot of truck volume suddenly made the switch to short sea connection, which, which was positive to see. And why was that? Because a lot of borders got blocked, certainly in the first phase of lockdown where, where a lot of uh, governments and, and, and people didn't really know how to handle it. So a lot of trucks got blocked and there was a lot of switch from truck to short sea. So, so this is something uh, to have a look at and to keep in mind if you want to have a stable process, you might have a look at the maritime uh, connections. This is a few, these are a few numbers um, with import to Antwerp and export to Turkey. Because today, uh, Turkey is already a very important trading partner for us as a port. We handle a lot of volumes with Turkey. Doesn't say that it could always grow, of course, but you can see that we had a growth uh, from 2017 compared to 2019. Um, and also, again, a growth on 2020. These are only showing eight months of cargo with Turkey, but we already um, dealt, uh, we handled more cargo with Turkey than last year, included lockdown. So, so it, it's a very good year um, dealing, uh, handling containers with Turkey. So the numbers you can see are TEU. And the ports mentioned on the right is like a top seven of ports on which we have handled cargo with both import and export. This is a slide showing where Antwerp is, because if we think of, of ports, uh, mostly we think of uh, port being a maritime a seaport, but we are a river port. This doesn't hold us from being able to receive uh, all the carriers, uh, the, the vessels from the shipping lines and the biggest vessels can reach Antwerp being an inland port. The advantage is also that you are more inland located. You might lose a little bit of time uh, going down the river. Uh, it takes a vessel maximum around 12 to 24 hours, um, but you are much more located inland, which you win on tracking distance or barge or rail. This is, these are the countries in Europe which you can, can uh, reach um, from the port of Antwerp. The red zones, you can reach uh, the red countries less than 24 hours and maximum 48 hours. And the other colors are logic to see. I'm speaking of truck distances, but you can also reach a lot of cities in Europe by rail and also by barge. This, these are um, a, a lot of volumes are being transported by rail and barge. I don't have enough time to 
uh, deep dive into this uh, subject. But if you are interested in getting to know the offers, um, the availability, how it works, we can also help you to explain. So I'm going to show you uh, our port itself and which cargo do we handle. It's just a glimpse of it because we, we actually have a lot of different activities. So I just explained you that we are a river port. We are connected to the river Skeld, but we receive the biggest container vessels. This is a proof of it. Uh, this was the HMM Algeciras, um, a loading capacity of 24,000 TU, which called Antwerp on the 11th June. So this is uh, today um, the record holding ship, um, which was having a capacity of 24,000 TU. So we have five deep sea container terminals. We deal around 11.9 million TU annually, and we are accessible for those mega vessels. Uh, I have to speed up a bit because I see I'm passing my time, but uh, I would like you to show you this uh, picture, which is the Durgang Dock. It's the biggest container terminal in Europe, and it has a K length of 5.3 kilometers. So you can see on both sides, we are handling uh, those mega vessels at the same time. So we have the capacity as a port to handle six of those types of vessels at the same time at that terminal. You have at this terminal two terminal operators. You have PSA operating one side of the terminal and you have uh, DP World uh, operating another side of the terminal. So Peter explained about the bonded warehousing. Almost the whole surface of our port, which you can see on the slide, is offering covered warehousing uh, capacity, including the bonded warehouses. If we speak of bonded warehousing, we also uh, like to use the term virtual free zone. For example, in China, they speak of virtual free zone and they don't really understand the term bonded warehousing. So you can see the whole uh, port area is bonded free zone. We handle brake bulk. Uh, we are specialized in brake bulk. Also, we have a lot of dedicated brake bulk terminals to offer this kind of handlings, which sometimes are dangerous. Uh, they are handling oversized cargo. You need heavy lift equipment, etc. But we have a dedicated and specialized terminal to handle these um, goods. We are Europe's largest integrated chemical cluster. So I already explained that we have a lot of industry in our port. This is a picture uh, taken in the middle of our port where, where a lot of companies are processing chemicals. You have like BISF is over there, Total, etc. So all the world-class players are located in our port. So we have uh, 7.5 million a uh, square meter of liquid bulk storage. We have 18 liquid bulk terminals and we have a lot of polymers storage capacity where, for example, Katunasi is also one of those specialized players in this polymer storage and, and uh, value added um, services. Not only break bulk chemicals, but also perishables. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, cold storage in our port. We handle all types of perishables, foods, also pharmaceuticals uh, and health products is also one of the special uh, specialities uh, because we see a lot of uh, pharma cargo making the switch from air to sea. Uh, and that's also something uh, we work on and we try to optimize. So this is an example of the dedicated um, perishables terminal where vessels especially coming from Latin America, are being discharged and tropical fruit is directly discharged from the containers in those warehouses, making um, being ready to deliver to the market. This is an example of a reefer stack on the container terminal. Um, just for you to give you an idea, we have around 8,000 reefer plugs in our port of Antwerp, divided into all the terminals. So this is almost the final of my presentation. Um, I can tell you why should you choose for Port of Antwerp. It's an excellent location. It's interland located. You are close to 60% of the purchasing power in Europe within a range of 500 kilometer. You know, 500 kilometer is not a long distance to cover. It's cost effective. We have uh, competitive destination cost. We have attracted 
uh, attractive cost for TIC, uh, warehousing, value added logistics, and also the people are important. The people make, make it a success. We have a hands-on uh, mentality with high qualified workers. We have dedicated teams and representatives, so you can always reach out to us uh, for any type of question or ID, uh, you can always can contact us. So that's the um, end of my presentation, and I would like to thank FIT for inviting us. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, it was uh, really informing and the, to the point, actually. And uh, our last guest speaker is Sinan Benzut. Uh, he is a logistics and uh, supply chain management professional. You may know Katunasi is an international logistics service provider and port operator, and they present in 28 countries. Uh, Sinan is general manager at Katunasi Turkey. Now uh, we listen curiously to smart logistics and engineering solutions at Katunasi. Sorry, Sinan. Yes. yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Esgi, for inviting me for this a very nice and interesting uh, seminar. Uh, of course, I'm the last one and hopefully not the least one. I've got, I think, uh, if I'm counting well, one minute to go over my 50 slides, I think, but I will try to uh, do my best. Um, So um, I'm going, uh, and maybe, and not everyone is knowing Katuna, so I will give you a first um, introduction about what KTN is, what Katuna is, um, and then afterwards I will speak more and dive in more in details uh, about which kind of services that you can expect in Flanders, or more specifically in, in the port of Antwerp, and as well some value-added services uh, and as well um, some other solutions that you might expect with regards to the future as well um, in the context of smart, of course. Um, first of all, uh, in a nutshell, uh, it's a movie of uh, 30 seconds that I can provide you um, and speaking about which... Just a minute. I'm trying to... So, this was just a short movie about the history of, um, of uh, KTN, about Katu Nasi. As you can see, we have uh, started our business in 1854. And uh, in the next slide, you can see some facts and figures about the company uh, with our headquarters in Antwerp. Uh, we are uh, pre present in 30 countries. We are more than, we are with more than 10,000 people. Uh, a lot of logistics platforms worldwide. Uh, more than 50 million square meters of um, of warehousing and as well some vertical storage as well. Um, some overview on which services uh, that uh, our company is providing, especially in the vertical petrochemicals, we are quite much strong in grid and. Uh, and uh, Ingrid has already has told uh, that we are quite uh, effective on, on uh, providing service on, on this sector. Uh, food and feed, specialty chemicals, consumer goods, of course, general cargo and, and a special vertical. It's um, about uh, the art that we have, um, that we can store uh, for a lot of museums, etc. Uh, and as well, some supporting uh, verticals uh, that we have uh, as well, supply chain engineering and process engineering. And we do as well, as Ingrid, Ingrid has mentioned as well, we have uh, our own um, facilities and our construction um, with regards to uh, the port operations. 
the locations where we are based, as you can see, the red dots, um, and I will give you as well the details in which cities uh, that KTN is uh, present worldwide, um, as you can see, North America, South America, Europe, uh, some parts of Africa, and as well um, uh, the Far East. So the next chapter is about, uh, I will go more in detail about which kind of platforms that you can expect um, in, in Flanders. Um, so you have the different platforms that you can use, of course, uh, nearby the port, you see a view on, 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 on the terminal uh, on the right bank of the river of Skelt uh, with a lot of warehouses uh, as well, some silo storage as well port activities and this is a nice view on the platform uh, a nice view on a distribution platform in Antwerp. Uh, some next slides uh, that you have an, an idea about the different platforms. So a lot of silo farms over there, just never uh, just nearby a river uh, and as well some warehouses. As well a next uh, a nice picture about another distribution platform. And another one. And as well, you can see um, the platforms, the DCs uh, um, connected to, uh, directly connected as well to the railway and as well some highways as well. Uh, a lot of, as you can see, uh, warehouses over here as well. So we have as well a uh, support platform over an overflow platform we are where we are just uh, located nearby a production plant uh, in order to support them uh, with um, storing their goods um, in the warehouse or in the silos. Uh, we have we are as well uh, based um, or you can expect as well in, 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 in Flanders that we do as well on site operations that um, a lot of logistics uh, is being done inside of the site of the terminal or the production plant of our customers. Um, the next ch chapter will be more about the service solutions. Um, so the regular warehousing, as you can see, racked warehouses uh, or uh, non-racked warehouses, automated warehouses, more specifically uh, for our uh, for the vertical e-commerce is being used. Of course, the pick pack and the package. And then it's been conveyed um, by conveyor belts and then going directly um, to the loading part of the warehouse. Here you can see the vertical storage. That's a view, or a nice picture, uh, to my opinion, with a lot of uh, silo farm, uh, the silo, uh, silos in a, in a silo farm uh, that you can see there are a lot of coming bulk or uh, bulk commodities into the silos and then you can unload the product and then as well uh, load from the uh, from the bottom of the silo farm directly to the bulk uh, truck as well. This is the mechanism how the silo structure works. Um, as you can see uh, from the silo, you can directly put your commodity into a packaging, a T25 kg um, and as well um, to, for example, to a big bag or directly load into an aligner container, or as you can see as well, directly to the uh, silo truck. This is a, a view on the intermediate floor of a silo farm, uh, which is going from the silos directly to the, to the railway, to the wagon, to the railway wagon. Um, as you can see, this is the same concept a little bit. You can do uh, the packaging directly as well, or to uh, load the uh, the wagon, the railway wagon, directly with the commodities. Some um, some more information about the value added engineering. Uh, so you, if you have some commodities, especially in the petrochemicals, and you have some irregular products in your production or some fails in your production, and you want to remove or separate. Uh, the colored uh, products, for example, with um, uh, from from the other colors, we have uh, the solution for that. We call it the optical sorting. It's going uh, via a conveyor belt uh, to through um, the optical uh, cameras. That the cameras are uh, saying that the the irregular 
should be separated. For example, the red color uh, commodity should be separated. It's falling down to a filter. And then you have done the accepted uh, commodity or the product at the end of the belt. Demetallizing, it's as well, um, if you have some metals or something like that within your products, you see uh, exactly that you can put out that metal uh, via a special system that can be provided. Uh, blending of products, if, you, uh, if, the, if the customers want to have some other products uh, blended um, um, from one, one to another one, and then making a one, one product of that, it's as well possible. Detesting, uh, a lot of dust within your products, it's as well available. This is a system, as you can see on the picture, which is uh, perfectly can be used for that. Uh, degassing, I just want to give you an, uh, an example on that. If you, you, maybe everybody knows if you buy a new car, you, you will have the smell on that and some uh, auto, uh, automotive production um, companies want, don't want to have that smell anymore. Then you, um, then what we do is, uh, as a company as well, or as a value-added services, uh, that we can gas that product and that the smell is gone, and that you uh, have that that new car smell not anymore within your car. Um, it is a special process for that as well. These are. The example that you can see on the picture as well with um, some installation that it's been used for. Compounding, it's as well another process um, to compound some products uh, from a different grade, etc. to one. Uh, grinding as well and shredding, these are as well some other services uh, that you can expect in the Flanders. A special a uh, sector and a special vertical that we are calling is the art storage. A lot of musea has a lot of uh, art uh, in their basement or in their storage. And this should be, of course, uh, stored in an, a very optimized manner or, or technique. And, and, and one of the services that, that, the, that the company can provide, and, and, and it's a very specific uh, in, a, in an environment where the temperature is controlled, the humidity is controlled, oxy oxygen is controlled. For example, the oxygen is being controlled that you cannot enlight uh, uh, some fire uh, within, 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 within the box uh, in order to keep, uh, the, the, of course, the products or the, or the art uh, very safe. Uh, then is the then is the climate a very stabilized? Uh, even the loading and the unloading part of the, of the warehouse is being conditioned in order to have that optimal uh, climate uh, when the art is entering the warehouse or going out the warehouse. Of course, the advanced security systems are ex expectable. Of course, the, the the products or the art is of course in with a with a high value and this should be controlled very well. And uh, which is which is as well uh, very important the pest control of course. Um, in the logistics, uh, the people who are working in the logistics will know it very well. Uh, you have the alternative or the the very basic fumigation. Um, it's with with a with a sort a certain a chemical product that you can fumigate commodities like cacao and coffee. But there are as well other warehouses. Uh, there are warehouses where we can condition the warehouse, uh, heat it up uh, to 30 degrees, and then with a low oxygen uh, controlling that you can just uh, yeah uh, can get rid of the insects that you don't want to have it in your product. So this is as well another service that I can. I give more information on that as well as sorting and grading installation is being used a lot of uh, for the coffee and the cacao um, then you put cacao cacao or co the cacao beans uh, from one side of the installation it's going and it's been sorted out and it's been graded out and then at the end it's been packed to a uh, to, to a big pack or another packaging format as well on a nice uh, example on on, uh, on value-added services. A lot of companies in Belgium, uh, especially in the Flanders as well, are um, as well committed to sustainable future. 
Uh, you see a lot of solar panels uh, on the warehouses, especially at the terminals where KTN, KTN is, and as well some wind turbines as well. I can give you the example, um, uh, about 20 megawatts uh, producing of electricity via wind turbines, and as well about 24 megawatts of electricity is going uh, coming from the solar panels. This is just to give you a view. A lot of electricity has been produced, which is as well, of course, nice to have as a, for, the, for the future and, and especially for the environmental expectations. Um, KTN, uh, there are of, of, as well a lot of companies who are committed to the Operation Clean Sweep, uh, which is as well um, an, a kind of a campaign which has been launched, especially by the chemical cluster uh, within Antwerp that a lot of products don't want to uh, be in loss uh, in, in the sea or in the river. So there are some uh, installations that it's been invited, uh, that it's been uh, getting used uh, for um, to have that product the, or the product spills uh, in, getting into the water or getting into the river or in the sea. So on the right picture, you can see the truck. Uh, that's a vacuum truck, the, which is cleaning all the sewers on the terminal with a with a vacuum system uh, that is getting all these spills out of the sewers, that in order to try, of course, that the, that the spills are not going to the into the just the sewer system uh, of the of the city or the, of the port, uh, and then uh, and then that vacuum it's been uh, containerized or the, stored all the spills into the truck, and the truck is uh, and the spills are being used, of course, uh, or recycle. Uh, uh, to do a recycle on, on the products and it's been used, of course, again in the industry. On the left picture, you can see a kind of a car wash system with a pressure system that when before leaving uh, the, the terminal, the truck leaves the terminal, it's going to a kind of a air pressure system that uh, that everybody or the, that we know that, that uh, every spill on the truck uh, is being, um, yeah, pressurized and all the products is falling down in, in a special of a kind of a filter uh, under the bottom or under the ground that is being as well can be used as well as a as a recycled product again you see here some views on on on, on the filters on the sewers uh, it's all uh, a filter uh, and then we can just uh, put out that filter uh, that product and, and then uh, it's going again as well uh, to the recycling and using uh, the innovation. Um, another chapter uh, is about the innovations uh, that you can expect. Uh, that we, uh, for example, we have the boost system. Uh, the boost system is a kind of reservation system. Before entering the terminal, or before coming to the terminal, you want to pick up your products. You can uh, do a nice reservation uh, via a system. You get, you can get your passport, and then you do, um, you you enter the the web the web uh, the website, and then you can just book your slots uh, for unloading your uh, product or loading your product uh, in. Uh, before, uh, in, for example, uh, you can book the slots before one day uh, before the loading. Another um, another innovation is, for example, you don't have any physical contact anymore at the reception desk when you enter the terminal and you go to the offices. You just have a, you can um, receive a QR code or you just put in your license plate. You just choose your language, and then you, and then afterwards, it's automatically that uh, the office people uh, that uh, can have the information for which uh, product that you come to load or to unload, or for which especially uh, special service that you want to get, etc. This is all being uh, communicated electronically via this automation, uh, automated reception desk. Another one is, of course, eh, when the uh, when the driver, for example, uh, put their license plate in that in uh, in the system, the, the forklift driver automatically gets their information via uh, via a special e-order system on their screen, and the driver, the forklift driver, especially knows or uh, exactly knows where which product is being downloaded, which uh, which truck driver has arrived, which truck has arrived, etc. All this information is all been uh, displayed on on their screen. 
and as well um, nice to have as well a uh, railway management system that we have um, nice uh, with the uh, tablets that you can exactly see which where the railway wagon is uh, unloaded uh, or empty or loaded etc nice to have as well this is not yet uh, in place in Antwerp in the Flanders but I want to show you that as well there are as well uh, drive uh, driverless trucks uh, in the logistics which um, is a nice innovation to my to my opinion this is uh, currently uh, used uh, in Singapore and hopefully as well um, having that probably uh, drive around this kind of a truck in the port of Antwerp as well this is a truck who is doing the commuting between the port and the stackyard or the, of the storage warehouse uh, etc it depends on but it's a driverless uh, nice innovation track uh, automate automated uh, packaging systems as you can see on the picture um, this is a palletizing system it's going via conveyor we call it the FFS uh, system there is another load system uh, coming from that packaging conveyor system going directly onto a kind of a load plate and then from that load plate automatically uh, loading the container um, some other nice innovations nice to have uh, is as well the facial uh, recognition uh, for example if you have employees and you don't want that these kind of employees are entering a kind of a certain zone or a certain building and that they can exactly uh, that they can have access uh, in that in that zone or not or you can especially see of that employee has that uh, the, the 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 necessary trainings uh, before entering the, that zone, etc. This is well being used currently in the logistics. Uh, this is very small but a nice innovation to my opinion as well. Um, locks which has been unlocked or locked by a Bluetooth via a Bluetooth via a tablet. Um, 24 hour services uh, via a chatbot. Uh, this is uh, you can perfectly download uh, a kind of an app um, uh, onto your smartphone and you can uh, if you have any questions that you have 24 hours 707 service uh, from from that logistics company uh, there is as well uh, existing a smartphone app as I said with the chat box but there is as well a, a another uh, feature in that in that app that can be used uh, for checking in the driver before entering or before entering the zone logistics zone that uh, the people in the office uh, who wants to receive or wants to load um, that they can perfectly see which driver is, uh, is coming in and which driver already has checked in you can perfectly do it as well it's kind of a similar thing uh, with the check-in for your flights uh, the same um, option is as well uh, you have as well a kiosk uh, before come entering the the zone or the terminal uh, buildings uh, that you can uh, just just show your QR code and then uh, uh, all, all the information is automatically being transferred uh, to the office that they can perfectly see which truck driver is entered in and as well a nice uh, to have as well these kind of uh, smart solutions that uh, uh, that a lot, a lot of truck drivers are coming in and going out like and, and as well of course for the safety and as well uh, having an optimized uh, parking uh, place uh, it's which you, you, have, you know of course truck dry, uh, trucks are taking a lot of space uh, on the terminals and therefore it's it's nice to have it to have that coordinated um, our um, our colleagues uh, who did the presentation um, spoke about the drones of course you cannot move any containers for the currently in the logistics but uh, the drones can be used as a surveillance uh, tool um, to have a view a nice uh, uh, to have a view on, on what's what's going on on the terminal which is uh, and as well as well for the safety for any theft etc these are the drones that's been for for the moment used uh, currently and as well uh, VR Google's especially for the training before the people are entering certain zones that they can get the training via the VR Google's as well this is um, hopefully uh, within a, within 10 minutes that I have uh, 
get uh, in order to have this presentation uh, that I have uh, tried to explain you as well um, about uh, engineering and the smart solutions that you can have uh, currently in Flanders. I thank you for your uh, interest and as well um, um, for, for, the, for the time uh, that you have uh, provided. So um, thanks.